welcome. Welcome to the Asian Pacific Islander and Desi Americans uh, APIDA's caucus session on CAST. Uh, my name is Vang Vang, co-chair of APIDA and a librarian at Fresno. I am Hmong American. I have long black hair and currently dark red blouse on. Thank you for making the time for us tonight. We appreciate your interest and support in wanting to learn more about CAST and hopefully together we can eliminate caste discrimination or become better allies to our students and colleagues who are experiencing this injustice. We will begin with land acknowledgement by giving Andrew Chang, our APIDA staff and CFA World Phil representative at Cal State Fullerton. And then I will ground us in. Uh, Lisa Kowamera will, our co-chair of APIDA and professor at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo will read our interruption statement. So go ahead, Andrew, you're up. Thank you so much, Vang, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, good to be here in this space with you all. Um, like Vang said, my name is Andrew Chang, and uh, I'm a field representative with the California Faculty Association and also have the pleasure of being the staff person for the APITA caucus. Um, I am a, uh, an Asian American cis man with short, puffy hair uh, and dimples. And I'm happy to read the land acknowledgement. We want to acknowledge that we gather as the California Faculty Association on the traditional land of the, of the indigenous people past and present and honor with gratitude the land itself and the people who have stewarded it throughout the generations. This calls us to commit to continuing to learn how to be better stewards of the land we inhabit as well. To recognize the land is an expression of gratitude and appreciation to those whose territory we reside on and a way of honoring the indigenous people who have been living and working on the land from time immemorial. It is important to understand the longstanding history that has brought us to reside on the land and to seek to understand our place within that history. Land acknowledgements do not exist in a past tense or historical context. Colonialism is a current ongoing process, and we need to build our mindfulness of our present participation. Acknowledging the land is an important indigenous protocol that we are honoring here today. And I live and work on uh, Tongva land here in Long Beach, California. My name is Lisa Kawamura. I'm from San Luis Obispo campus, Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. Uh, I teach in the communication studies department and hold a lot of other Hats. I'm the lecture representative at San Luis Obispo and also a proud co uh, APIDA caucus chair with uh, Vang. So thank you so much for being here this evening. Um, we'd like to start with a brief introduction of how CAS was introduced um, to us as the APIDA caucus here at CFA. And I'll pass it over to Vang. Yes, thank you, Lisa. Many of you may recall that we passed a resolution in spring 2021 at our 93rd assembly. The resolution was sponsored by the APIDA caucus. The resolution called for the CSU to include CAST in its anti-discrimination policy by updating the language within the executive order 1096 and 97 to explicitly make clear that CAS is a protected category and affirm the CSU's commitment to serving CAS oppressed students, staff, and faculty. At the bargaining table, we knew that the chancellor's office was in the process of updating the executive orders. So our amazing Kathy Sheffield, director of representation and co-chair of the bargaining team, argued for CAS to be included in our contract as well. For how could we not follow our own resolution? Adding caste as a protected category in our contract is not about banning religious beliefs or practices, but discriminatory treatments only. Including caste as a protected category provides protection for individuals who would otherwise be victims of intentional discrimination motivated by caste. It is not members of Hindu, Buddhist, Sikh, or Muslim faith that are the targets of such measures. Rather, the targets and only targets are those who discriminate against another person due to the unchosen trait of being born into a certain caste. And we all know that caste discrimination is not limited to a single country, religion, region. It is a caste system 
that can be found in multiple South Asian countries in Africa, other parts of Asia, the Middle East, and in diaspora communities all around the world. After the presentation, we will have time for open Q&A, which Lisa will moderate. We encourage you to ask questions and engage with us, for it is through engagement that we learn, grow, and thrive. It was through student activists like Mehmet, who you will be meeting, and Prim, that the Cal State Student Association, CSSA, passed a very similar CAS resolution to ours with a 22 to zero vote in April, 2021. It was also through students like them that brought CAS to APEDA and to CFA. So without much, I wanted to say thank you, Prim, Demori, Mehmet, and the floor is yours. Wow, what an incredible um, introduction. And, you know, it's such a reminder of how we hold each other in justice and that so much of workers' rights is connected with human rights struggles around the world and here at home. So thank you, Vang, and thank you all for the folks that are here from CFA. Uh, my name is Thanmori Sandararajan, and I'm executive director of Equality Labs. We are a Dalit or caste depressed um, civil rights organization that works on the issue of caste equity around the country. And, um, you know, in terms of my description, um, I am curly haired. Um, I have cocoa brown skin, super fly cat eye glasses, and a rainbow jacket that um, I know if I saw someone wear, I would be really envious of. So, um, but to be honest, you know, old jokes aside, it's really a profound thing to be here with Cal, the, the California Faculty Association as someone who was a Dalit student that went through um, California universities, I was someone that experienced very difficult levels of caste discrimination when I went to UC Berkeley. And if I had a resolution as strong as the one that CFA passed um, through both the collective bargaining agreement and the larger change in the policy for the Cal State, um, maybe I would have been a Cal State faculty member today. Um, but, you know, to be honest, the, the level of discrimination and harassment that you face as a Cal depressed student, particularly if you were out, which I was, um, was too much. And, um, and so, of course, you know, to be here and be part of the civil rights movement, I want to congratulate everyone here um, from CFA for the incredible leadership, because just this week, we have confirmation that 40 new universities, that's four zero new universities are working on adding CAS as a protected category, many of whom are unions who are just so excited and thrilled about the leadership of CFA's work around caste equity and civil rights. So I just really want to thank everybody there. And if you're at home, you know, twinkle, if you want to pat yourself on the back, this is how civil rights are won when we hold and carry water together. So with that, um, I wanted to actually share my screen because um, I would like to um, uh, do a short little um, PowerPoint that can actually give us a little bit of context to the issue of caste and you know I know that there's a lot of questions and so this is meant to kind of give us some shared definitions and you know a lot of times like if you're not familiar with the usage of the term caste I mean caste is a system of exclusion analogous to race um, it affects over 1.9 billion people um, you know, so one in four people in the world lives under some form of um, a caste system. And this exclusionary system ranks people at birth with, you know, one's caste determining every aspect of their life, their job, where they can live, whom they marry, where they worship, and very crucially, their proximity to violence and structural, um, structural exclusion. And, you know, I think that, you know, for, for those of us who, you know, aren't from South Asian backgrounds, I also think it's important to think about, well, caste comes from immigrants that come from South Asia. So what are the countries that we're talking about? So we're talking about immigrants from Bangladesh, Bhutan, India, Maldives, Nepal, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, and Myanmar. And we're also talking about indentured communities. So that might be Indo-Fijian, which is a huge population that is in the Cal State 
states, as well as Indo-Caribbean and Indo-African communities. So in terms of scope, you know, just within the South Asian context, we're talking about 5.4 million South Asian Americans. And so there's a huge portion of uh, South Asians that make up the Cal State project, um, Cal State system, as well as other communities across the world that have similar systems of uh, exclusion based on um, job and um, descent. And so these are all of the folks that would avail themselves of a category related to caste. Now, I know sometimes like when we talk about caste, people are like, well, I want to know, like, what is it like? How did it come and where is it rooted? So, you know, caste in its origins come from Hindu scriptures, but it's actually found across all South Asian religions. This is why people oftentimes are very uncomfortable with rooting caste, like as under the, the special category of religion, because at this point, whether you're Muslim or you're Christian or if you're um, Buddhist, or um, or Hindu or sick, you are seeing caste manifest within your communities. And so it's much better to look at it as its own distinct category and to understand the hierarchies that operate, you know, within this general kind of caste pyramid formation. So generally, um, in, you know, in the traditional caste system, you have, you know, a caste at the top that were the Brahmins. And, you know, again, because this was, you know, something rooted in scriptural practice, the priests were the ones that wrote the scriptures, that wrote the order of exclusion. And, you know, and I think caste like race is like a social fiction, right? We, we all know that white people are not, you know, racially superior to anyone else. So the people who had the power basically wrote a fiction so that they could keep the power over other people. This is exactly what happened within the caste system. So you have Brahmins that are at the top, you have Kshatriyas who are the warrior ruler caste, you have Vaishyas who are the merchants and they're the people that do business and commerce. And then you have people who are the peasants, the Shudras. And these are the folks that did like, you know, manual labor and, um, and other things to kind of service society. And all of the castes that were within this pyramid, you know, what's very crucial and very distinct about the way that social exclusion works and under caste systems is the higher you are up on the caste pyramid, the more pure your job and the more pure you are in society. And the more that you go down the pyramid, you obviously have more and more people, but more and more of those professions are actually seen as polluting and defiling for people. And that becomes really critical when we talk about the castes that are the untouchable castes or the people like Prem and I, we actually don't use the term untouchable, we use the term Dalit. These are the, the castes that are so dirty so excluded because our jobs were the worst of the worst um, that we're not even considered part of the pyramid. We just live outside of it. And, you know, for our peoples, like we were seen as untouchable because to touch us meant that another caste would actually become spiritually defiled and they would have to go and get purified. Whereas we would get beaten or we would face other sorts of other severe crimes because we dared to cross this caste apartheid line. You know, and the jobs that we had as Dalits were cleaning up the trash of other communities, picking up the literal shit, you know, like in terms of sewage practices of other communities, processing dead bodies, you know, even, um, you know, playing the music for the funeral processes of other communities. So it's the worst of the worst jobs. And, um, and we're told that we cannot leave the conditions of our oppression, because again, this is a system both rooted in religion and structural power. Now, um, when I said that we don't use the term untouchable, I think that's a very important thing for people to know why. Um, when they said that we were untouchable, it's not just that we were ritually, pure, you know, uh, defiling, but that we actually had no place before God. And, you know, for us, a critical part of our self-determination is that nobody gets to define the divine for anybody else. So we really eschew the word untouchable and use terms like Dalit or we might identify with our religion because like with a term like Dalit, it's a political term, very much the way that black is, you know, and it means someone who is broken 
but also someone who is resilient. So I would encourage you, especially as you're building cast competency across your union, um, to you know be aware that people who identify as cast depressed may have very you know many different terms that they use. Untouchable is not an effective one, um, but oftentimes people will self you know describe themselves just like people do with other um, uh, and, uh, special categories. The other piece of the caste system is you have um, indigenous people who are not necessarily part of the system and they're called Adivasis. And these folks are the folks that, um, you know, are also, you know, have relationships to land based, their own spirituality and cosmos. And there are Adivasi students that are part of the Cal State system. And South Asian indigenous people may also use caste as a protected category. So whenever we're training the folks for understanding grievances, the main thing to kind of know in this caste um, system is that it's not just the tippy top people at the top, so like the Brahmins discriminating against Dalits, it's actually very similar to race. Um, everywhere along that pyramid, you can have discrimination occur. So you might have a caste discrimination case from Shudras who are complaining about Vaishyas. Or you might someone who who might be someone from a Kshatriya caste who's saying, you know, the Brahmin, uh, my Brahmin manager or my Brahmin professor really was discriminatory to me. Whatever it is, it's just important that whoever is doing the intake have at least a basic understanding of how these hierarchies work. So when they're conducting an investigation, they're able to ascertain what is the caste of the person that experienced harm and what did the intention of the harm doer understand it to be in relationship to a caste issue and just a final note about this caste system is that very similar to race oftentimes when people are discussing caste they go right to the interpersonal right they're like well i'm not casteist i don't know anybody who has this problem but just like with any system of exclusion you know systems of exclusions operate in multiple domains right the inter the internal the interpersonal the institutional and the structural and so i think what's very important to understand is that with the caste system the higher up that you go in that pyramid the greater access to ownership and resources and opportunities. And the lower you go, um, the more excluded you are. And that really determines immigration workflows because like in, in the South Asian diaspora, you have many dominant caste students that feel comfortable coming out in class, um, being present to talking about their identity and being forward about their opinions. And most caste oppressed students feel very intimidated to come forward because the consequences of coming out are so severe. Now, one of the other pieces that I really wanted to share, which is why we have been pushing as a community to ask for civil rights, um, you know, uh, as changes, is that we experience some of the highest levels of discrimination within the Asian American community. You know, one out of four Dalits said that they have faced verbal or physical assault. One in three discrimination in their education and two out of three um, being treated unfairly at the workplace and a university is both the site of education and also um, a site of um, employment and that's why it was such a tremendous thing for Cal the California Faculty Association to add CAS to the CBA because it protects workers and it protects crucial stakeholders in education and flanks that other win that we received um, from the administration. Um, because again, you know, the fear that people have because of these issues is so big that, you know, one in two Dalits are afraid of coming out, you know, um, because of their identity, because of those repercussions. And in the state of California, we have several high profile cases related to caste. You know, in the city of Berkeley, um, we had a landlord named Lucky Bali Reddy who trafficked over 300 workers, 20 of whom were young girls under 13 to be his sex slaves. He was dominant caste, they were all Dalit, and he did unmentionable and unspeakable things, both him and his family. And he was eventually prosecuted, and you know, his prosecution was basically the first case to document caste trafficking. And um, based on that, we got the first trafficking laws in the state of California. We also had in 2000, um, the California Department for Fairness and Employment and Housing suing Cisco Corporation, um, which is the first time an American workplace has been sued for creating a castus hostile environment. And the thing that's so incredible about this case is that the DFEH does not litigate unless they've done an investigation. 
And they didn't need to be an expert in caste to know that what was happening to the John Doe at the center of this case was extreme civil rights violations because he was targeted on the basis of his caste. He started to get demoted and face retaliation as he was siloed away from work product and diminished by his peers um, once his caste identity was found out. Um, and because of this case, Hundreds of Dalits um, have come out in institutions all across this country. So, you know, I know for us um, in Equality Labs, right after the Cisco case occurred, we got over 250 complaints from Dalits who were working in tech um, about extreme acts of discrimination. And so, again, this is why we're seeing caste as an extreme workplace crisis, which is why so many unions are coming forward to stand around this issue. And then we have another case in New Jersey um, where there is a temple called the BAPS Temple that lured workers that were cast oppressed and paid them $1.20 an hour to do very extensive backbreaking work in granite to build their temple site. And this case has now expanded to five temples across the country to hundreds of workers. And um, it's so severe that um, the, the workers have now amended their complaint to add RICO charges, you know, and for folks not familiar with RICO, that's what they use to kind of prosecute the mob um, for racketeering. And uh, so it's a very serious case. And we can see that this is one of the reasons why we talk about caste equity being a worker's rights. It's impacting all kinds of workers in all kinds of different situations, and, um, and we need a remedy. Now, I think when we start to think about reporting, we want to look at like, what are some of the challenges workers have? And I think a big part of, you know, thinking about making the win that you just had be implemented is we have to think about caste competency. Like, are the folks in HR and the people responsible for cultures of belonging in the university, do they really know enough about caste to be able to implement this? And, you know, one worker told me quite poignantly, you know, why would I even report to HR when they probably don't even know where India is on? the map. And so I think there's a lot of education around this that's really important for all of those stewards for um, DE, diversity and equity to make sure that we're all on the same page about this issue. And these are some of the things that workers have described in their workplaces related to caste discrimination. You know, insults and slurs, harassments, bias in hiring and promotion, disparate salaries, unfair peer reviewed, caste based sexual harassment, demotion and termination. You know, and, you know, to show how real this is, even for the California Faculty Association, one of the Dulit professors who I talked to who did so much campaigning on her campus, she was terrified to actually meet um, uh, union leadership because, one, you know, several of the opponents to this issue are actually in leadership in her department because um, she's in the STEM fields. And so, you know, she's not out on her campus and she was very worried about whether this was um, something that would be safe. And so she worked, you know, through anonymous channels to be able to do the, the campaigning work, but is still terrified to come forward. And I think this is going to, you're going to find this with other Dalit staff and faculty and students. The fear is palpable because our opponents are pretty vicious. Now, when we talk about the discrimination in the universities, there is a lot that's going on for students. And here, a South Asian indigenous student, you know, was compared to a zoo animal um, uh, by their other peers. And I think we just see similar, you know, very kind of thoughtless microaggressions and diminishments that lead to a lot of caste stress for Dalit stakeholders on campus. And, you know, again, we see a lot of similar kind of things that we see workers talking about, like from slurs and harassment but there's also some new ones like discrimination in housing and dining. Um, also, you know, being siloed and blacklisted from alumni and professional networks, cast as professors and syllabi, sexual harassments of students and retaliation. These are all things that we've had numerous reports from university campuses across the country. So being able to, you know, have the Cal State system lead the nation in addressing this is, is just so deeply historic and having supported both faculty and students who are just facing an incredible amount of caste harm, you can't, you can't underestimate how deeply appreciative and honored that people are that the Cal State, um, the California Faculty Association stood for justice and stood by us when we're experiencing such grave discrimination. 
And, and that's because there is a lot of um, impacts to cast stress, you know, there's a sense of being isolated, um, being fearful and anxious and depressed, you know, many students, I just talked to this one student, he thought about, you know, doing self harm, um, or dropping out because he did not feel like he had the strength and the support ecosystem he needed to be able to stay in his program. And this is something that we think about all the time around diversity and equity. It's not just about access, it's about success. And we have to ensure that when we are make the most vulnerable students be the leaders on our campuses, we have to give them all the tools that they need in order to be able to thrive. And when I think about my first meeting with Prem, you know, there is a there is a scenario, there is a multi where he didn't get the support that he needed. And instead of being able to be the amazing leader and collaborator that he was to California Faculty Association, he could have dropped out. And we would have lost an incredible gem of an emerging scholar. And that's why I want to make sure that we can really address this, you know. And to close, here are some things that we know that we need to get more institutions to do. We want CAS to be added as a protected category. We need to implement diversity and inclusion training for HR managers and staff to build CAS competency. We also need to collect data on this issue and hold public briefing. It might also be useful to see if we could conduct a review of past cases of CAS discrimination, just so we can get a sense of the terrain of what we might shift. Um, when we're looking at these issues of cast on campus. And then just on an individual set, you know, I think Cal California Faculty Association is like an amazing, you know, collaboration of allies. But, you know, being able to start to kind of include cast with all of your acknowledgements related to cast as a protected category and helping more people be aware of where there might be um, precise, the, the usage of language that can, you know, promote implicit and explicit bias. Um, and trainings for union members around how to be upstanding um, around these issues so that the burden of equity is not on the excluded. Um, all of these things um, are really beautiful ways for us to build the movement that we want. And again, I'm going to pass it now to Prem to talk about his story. But, you know, California Faculty Association, again, I cannot thank you enough for your incredible courage for with us. Um, I know that I had family members in India that had tears in their eyes. And, um, and, and that's why I'm saying you set a global, global model for what it means to have worker power um, be heard all around the world. So thank you. And I pass it to Prem. Thank you. Thank you for this beautiful introduction. I'm, I'm very grateful to the organizer for creating this cast panel at this equity conference. Uh, I'm a Nepali brown man with caste oppressed identity with uh, brown skin, glasses, and a blue suit. I just got a haircut. So I have some hair uh, that is growing back too. I'm a Cal State East Bay social work graduate. I'm one of the lead organizers of this caste advocacy at the CSU system. I'm living in the Bay Area with my two kids and wife. I'm very blessed to be part of this civil rights movement in the US. Uh, the caste overview by Thunmari Sundararajan can make you aware about the historical context of caste and related intersectionalities impacting South Asians in uh, North America and the world. So I'm here to share my personal experiences with caste in, in the CSU. So wherever I would go, people labeled me as untouchables or uh, lower caste in Nepal. Even when I was discriminated against or called names and casteist slurs at my college, college in Nepal, I could not report because the college did not have the place to report it, no policy at all. So as caste oppressed student, uh, we were forced to re be resilient and put up with the discrimination. 
we were forced to become habituated and take this discrimination against us easily. I'm one of the countless caste oppressed peoples who have faced caste discrimination here in the US, the democratic country. I came here undocumented, fleeing caste and political persecution in Nepal. Eight, I have experienced the same caste discrimination I tried to escape. I experienced caste discrimination multiple times. I do remember my first experience of caste discrimination soon after I arrived in California. A dominant caste friend invited me to lunch at her friend's house. I know that caste unjustly determines who you can and cannot sit and eat with. I was hesitant before. However, I joined hoping that I had left caste discrimination behind in Nepal. During lunch, when it was my turn to serve myself, I was stopped and told not to approach because I would pollute the food. Instead, a plate would be prepared and handed to me. I realized after that incident, though I, escaped, I had escaped caste persecutions in Nepal, the discrimination and humiliation because of my birth as caste oppressed had followed me to the US. Even though I belong to the same Hindu religion as everyone at the launch, I was seen as less than because of my caste. When I was a graduate student in the social work department at CSU East Bay, I could not report cases of discrimination to administration because I was aware of the non-discrimination policy and caste was not protected or recognized like race, gender, and other categories. I shared my experience with caste discrimination in the classroom, but some of my South Asian colleagues did not validate my experience. They said, though I'm from South Asia, I don't know there is caste discrimination. So while my professors were not aware of the caste system, my South Asian colleagues were not only surprised, but also tried to silence me when I, they heard my experiences. They stopped to talk to me after I shared my experience and advocated for caste protections in the classroom. The social work department has a social workers graduate association. So this is my another example. So there was a call for leadership in the graduate association. The association was led by the dominant caste South Asian student. I expressed my interest to be the chair of the committee and shared my plans and programs. But without hearing me and asking me, the committee was formed by the leadership of dominant caste South Asian student. And they put me in the position where they like me in the marginalized role. They never asked my opinion. That was not for the first time. They started to distance themselves from me. I tolerated that. I thought I needed to educate my faculties and all the social work students because they are going to work in the community, educational institution and policy work in future. Their understanding of caste matters. So without learning the caste apart hate, how can they be, become a social workers and advocate for social justice? I talked to my professor Rubani about these experiences and she took my case seriously. She talked to the department chair and other faculties and connected me with Tanmari Sundara Rajan, the executive director of Equality Labs. So we were invited to the faculty meeting and Tanmari Sundara Rajan did a wonderful presentation about caste in the US and her research. So all the social work department faculties looked supportive after hearing students' testimonies, including me. 
So I got great support to organize a virtual conference on race, caste, and mental health on the occasion of World Mental Health Day on October 10, 2020. So the conference was able to create awareness of the historical context of caste, race, and related intersections impacting mental health to the social work students. The department head, Professor Sarah Taylor, made an announcement adding caste as the protected category at the mission statement of the department at that conference. So after that, the conversation around caste protection started at my department and other departments. So some of my friends from the dominant caste were not happy with that announcement. So I thought that this should not be limited within my department. So diversity, equity, and inclusion committee as well as faculties in ethnic studies, education, sociology, psychology, and other departments should care about caste discrimination. So I started communicating with them. And following this, the DEI committee drafted the caste resolution for the academic senate. So at the academic senate, what happened? It was not easy because there was a South in Asian professors from an Indian background and they tried to resist caste resolution. They said that caste discrimination was an Indian issue. And why do we need to have this conversation at CSU East Bay? At this time, at that time, I shared my personal stories to them and told them why this policy is important at the university level. So after hearing this, Testimonies, the academic senate passed this resolution unanimously. After this, the conversation started more widely and Equality Lab connected me with student leader Manmeet Singh, who is also a driving force first for caste protection. So we got the huge support from CSSA and we began our advocacy at the level of entire CSU system. Professor Rubani and Professor Kim Zeron provided me an opportunity to speak and share my experience as undocumented caste oppressed student at the California Faculty Association Immigration Panel on November 17, 2021. I do remember that day. So finally, after months of the advocacy, the CSU system adopted caste as the protected category. So this decision is very personal to me and other caste oppressed students, staff and faculties. And I mean, I want to say adding caste as a protected category is huge, but the implementation is very important thing. At a time when casteist violence and discrimination are on the rise, both in South Asia and in, in the diaspora. So the backlash to this historic civil rights victory has started by Indian professors, Indian dominant professors, dominant, you know, having dominant caste identity. And these attacks are part of a sustained effort by the Hindu rights to uphold caste supremacy under the use of fighting and imagined Hindu phobia. So I know I have taken much time. I'm so sorry for that. So let me pop on to another student leader, Manmit Singh. Thank you so much for your words. And thank you for really like kickstarting this movement. Um, thank you also, T, um, for all the words that you shared and like the education that you shared. Um, and it's really through like the work that Equality Labs and T has been doing um, that I was able to get connected um, to Brame um, because um, in terms of um, one of the things that like we've really been touching on has been like a lack of spaces dedicated to like caste competency. Um, and that's really like the, um, what would be so powerful for now that we do have caste protections, um, because there aren't spaces um, dedicated to caste competency. And so it was really through the work of the Mori and through the work of Equality Labs that um, I came across like spaces for the first time that were actually dedicated to holding um, the political education and holding space to so really learning about caste. Um, and then from there also got connected with Frame. Um, Oh, also really fast. I forgot to introduce myself. <laughs> um, my name is Manmeet. I'm so sorry. I totally just um, went deep in. I was so excited about this. My name is Manmeet. I use they them pronouns. Um, I am a South Asian non-binary trans person um, with brown skin um, and a light beard. Um, and I have a 
light blue crew neck. Um, and I kind of have dark circles under my eyes because <laughs> I need to sleep a little bit more. But um, so anyways, as I was um, saying, I want to really just commend Brame's work because um, I was so lucky to get connected with Brame and the work that he was doing at eSpace. So as he mentioned, he was really successful in getting um, a resolution passed through their academic senate. And that was really huge because um, that was really the first resolution that was going um, that was being passed throughout the entire CSU through their academic senate. And that served as a template um, for that was then re recycled and reused um, and passed across the entire state. So we had the same um, similar resolutions um, advocating for caste protections being passed at Cal Poly Slow through their student government. We had it passed through Cal Poly Pomona um, through their student government. And again, those were all unanimous being passed through the academic Senate at Cal Poly Slow. Um, and then finally, really moving over to the Cal State Student Association, which uh, most of you all probably already know really represents the voice of the CSU students students collectively. Um, so that was um, really power. Um, that's really where we witnessed like this hearing that went on for like two and a half hours, um, where we had the opposition that um, showed up in trying to really dismantle caste protections and dismantle caste equity work. Um, and during that open hearing that we had back in April, um, when that resolution was going through, um, that here, although there was that, uh, uh, the, the very vocal, but like a very small minority of folks who were coming forward um, in protest for caste equity, um, I think the board of directors really saw the, the saw through the tactics that they were using, um, because right when caste oppressed folks were coming forward and outing themselves, taking the risk to out themselves and to share their their experiences, we had uh, right after they would go, um, the, the folks coming forward saying caste does not exist. Like, what do you mean? Like really um, outrightly without any shame using um, gaslighting tactics, um, using intimidation tactics, um, making all types of, of just trying to really shut down the conversation of caste. And um, we're so thankful to the CSSA board to really have seen through that um, and have actually um, stood with on the right side of history really and pass the resolution in that moment um, and really standing firm that the, the officially half the million students across the CSU are committed to this work and are standing um, with um, our, our kin, standing with the cast press kin. Um, so, um, all, and then uh, I guess the other thing I really wanted to kind of touch on has been the, the, the power of this coalition that has really um, allowed for this historic victory because this, in order to really get us here, where the, now the largest four-year um, institution in the entire state of California has caste protections, it's really taken the work of an, a, a really beautiful inter-caste, interfaith, multiracial effort um, under the leadership that has brought us to this moment. Um, and I really want to just highlight um, how beautiful and powerful that has been because the way these systems of oppression work, whether it be um, caste supremacy, whether it be racism, whether it be cis heteropatriarchy, um, is really in stripping our ability to relate with each other and to be able to create like connections with each other. Um, and I think that what was so powerful about this movement has been um, the spaces that it has fostered in being able to really think about how do we find new ways of relating with each other and being in deep connection with each other that are beyond like these systems of violences. Um, so really like, um, and in, during that CSS hearing, we really witnessed the power of our coalition coming together with our coalition being an intercaste, interfaith, multiracial coalition. Um, and I think that really, um, again, like really, um, I, and that has been the consistent um, work like since the past like year and a half where we've had like students, staff and faculty of all backgrounds coming together on this really multi-layered approach with like resolutions being passed um, and students coming together and passing through them through student governments, like faculty coming together and passing them through their academic senates. Um, and I guess like, and to kind of close it off, like from my end, like me coming to this work as a caste privileged person and as a caste ally um, and how this work has been so transformative and not just in terms of thinking about the results of the work and where it has brought us in really creating material policy change, but in thinking also about like the process that it has taken to get here. Um, I, I'm, it's making me think about um, what Adrienne Murray Brown talks about in terms of what we put attention to grows. And I think that this work, like as Frame has been talking about it and as he has been talking about it, really is the contemporary civil rights movement. And as we think about what happens when we put our energy to growing civil rights movement, what happens when we um, put, our, put our energy to 
um, this movement that's really rooted in love and that's rooted in justice, um, I think that there, there's so much healing that's a part of that. Um, especially because like these systems of oppression themselves, and this is stuff that I've learned from like the Nori um, very beautifully said, like um, that these systems of oppression are traumatizing, right? They're traumatizing for everybody who um, is a part um, and of these systems of oppression and the dehumanization um, happening at different levels and at different scales. So really in being a part of this work and in coming to this work rooted in justice, we have this opportunity to recover our humanity. Um, and I think that was something that I've definitely like witnessed in coming to this work um, and thinking and really learning and um, relearning how do we relate with one another um, outside of these systems of violences. And I think that work itself has been world making. Um, and we invite y'all to also like come through, um, come and be a part of this work, uh, come and be a part of this world making work. Um, and have been so thankful to like CFA who has, who has been one of the um, leaders of really leading this movement in terms of um, like really um, being one of the folks that have been actively like creating the foundation for this new world that we're building. Um, so with that, I will pass it back to T um, for and really thinking about like future work and future steps. Um, thank you for that. And, you know, I want to just also take some time to thank our ASL interpreters. Um, we have given you a lot of work um, and I will do my best that we slow down for the rest of the panel. Um, but, you know, one thing that I did want to just kind of note is that you know, there are a couple of lessons that I would just like to flag for the the union. Um, you know, I think you guys went through such an incredible battle to get the CBA and, you know, even being in that Regents meeting, what was very clear is that there are very serious grave issues that are facing um, the rank and file. And, and I think that when, you know, given what you guys survived during COVID, um, uh, it was an incredible act of solidarity to extend yourself on an issue um, like caste equity um, when there were so many other issues. And I think that's why so many people were touched, you know, um, and, and really that connection of humanity just it was reverberated around the world. Um, and, and I think that, you know, one of the conversations and one of the kind of issues that CAST really brings up is that some of the new frontiers of civil rights isn't just about what happens when white supremacy is racializing us, but about what are the internal divides, like minorities within minorities, which is, you know, a community like ourselves, and how do we address and make sure that we continue to practice a culture of inclusion that gets to all these realms. And I know certainly, like, you know, we're not the only API community that has um, divides and challenges, um, but I think that the open door policy that the California Faculty Association had to this issue, I think is really also a process that you might see from other communities. And it was a really great win um, on so many levels. And I want to just kind of flag that in terms of reflections. Um, that said, just, you know, before I pass it back to our colleagues, you know, I do think that the work of the California Faculty Association is not done on this issue. And that's because like sometimes when you win and you're the leader, then everybody else wants to make sure that you're still in the fight. And, you know, and again, I, you know, I was just, I, I was talking to our organizers and I was like, oh yeah, we have like 20 campuses right now. And they're like, no, we have 40 campuses around the country that are moving cast as a protected category and they want to talk to CFA members because they're curious about what was the CBA process like what have you thought about in terms of implementation how do you imagine this like working in a practical way and CFA has great examples for grievance and um, processes of accountability with the institution and I think that you know knowing you know if there is interest in CFA being part of any of those conversations you know whatever appetite you have we definitely have you know options to feed it you know because there's just such a deep hunger to really move this issue at a national level um the other thing which i also wanted to kind of see is is that you know because cast is a workers rights issue the other thing that we're seeing is that people really want change at the state level and California is a really powerful place to do that. It not only had two of the most major workplace cases in labor history related to caste, 
but also um, we are the seventh largest economy in the world. Um, we also have an incredibly large API community. And, you know, Gavin, you know, Governor Newsom knows that the people who put him in power are unions. So if the nurses and the teachers and um, the communication workers and the steel workers say you're out of there, he knows he's got some serious work he's got, you know, he's going to have to do. And that's why I want to just also make a call to CFA that you know, if there's a way for us to build like a pan union movement to move the governor to change the discrimination policy at the statewide level, it would again set California, um, you know, to set the standard for the nation. And and we know that, you know, we already have the California Democratic Party who's added cast as a protected category between that um, win and the win of the California Faculty Association, we have millions of workers and millions of people who are impacted. And so, you know, that would just be my last kind of standing call. And so um, looking forward to the questions and I pass it back to our folks to coordinate. Thank you so much, Ben Mori, Prem, and Manmi. It has been a pleasure working on these um, panels with you and you know, every time I hear your stories, it just, it goes deeper and deeper and deeper into my heart. Um, I I also, Manmi, forgot to introduce myself also, or to describe myself. I am a Japanese American woman in her early 50s with longer, mostly salt like Audrina hair. Um, and uh, I wear a necklace around my neck um, with my family name. And today I'm wearing my CFA or CFA slow um, black shirt to show my support for our organization. And I'm so happy to be here today with you all and happy to be doing this work with you. Um, it started as a very simple ask from a former student um, at Cal Poly, which was my mate, um, saying, hey, can, can you, as part of a PETA leadership at Cal Poly, take this on. And, you know, then he got in touch with um, Dorothy Chen Maynard, who said, get in touch with Lisa. She's also a co-chair at the um, statewide union level. And, you know, the more, it just all took off. And so I'm so proud to be a part of this and getting the chance to educate our union about these kinds of issues. Given the history and the ongoing invisibilized caste-based discrimination happening in the CSUs and in the US, it's understandable that our faculty and students may be afraid of retaliation. And you all did such a great job of talking about that and really putting a face to that. Um, it's even, uh, even for revealing um, caste-based identities and for speaking on your experiences, let alone uh, filing formal discrimination complaints through CFA and the CSU. In terms of this context, what would you say to caste impacted faculty, staff, and students who want to stand up for their rights in the CSUs and not be afraid? So I think that what's really important is to have the right grievance channels, you know, um, I think, you know, and again, you know, someone who is, you know, one of the attendees, Professor Ruvani is here and I, I just want to give her a hug every time I see her name pop up or, you know, because so much magic happened when she connected me to Prem. But what it actually took was for her to have insight was that she had a student that was suffering and didn't have an immediate remedy. And there wasn't a clear process at the university, but she went that extra mile. And I know she went that extra mile because I was not easy to reach and she repeatedly reached out to me until she got me and then um, close that loop to make sure that we were connected. And, you know, I think, you know, what I've seen with the CFA API um, Desi Caucus is this was an issue that, you know, you, you know, you could have easily said, you know, we have other priorities. This is not gonna be the year that we do it. Um, but actually to add it at such a crucial time with the CBA to also take that risk because you guys were also on the front lines of having to deal with some of that blowback. Um, all of that speaks to the commitment of material solidarity that exists within unions as a whole. And I think that what's so important is that when we have trainings for 
union members so that they know how to spot and how to be an open channel related to grievance processes. Um, I think that that's what's going to make the difference because, you know, it could be small things like, for example, if you guys notice, um, uh, oh no, if you guys notice in our backgrounds, each of us have this image of this figure of this man with glasses. His name is Dr. Ambedkar, and he's kind of the, the Indian kind of Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, all put into one. He was the architect of the Constitution. But having his graphic signifies it's a safe space for caste oppressed people. You know, even being able to celebrate things like Dalit History Month, you know, which is happening in April. You know, when, you know, vis invisibility is what leads to violence. Visibility is what actually leads to power. And so being able to, you know, see if maybe CFA might want to do like one Dalit History Month event where we talk about worker power and caste equity. Um, you know, there's lots of ways, you know, that we can work on cultures of belonging. So, you know, starting from the top with training so that everyone can be a grievance channel, collaborating on visibility and events, and then working with other unions to, to really being able to make sure that this becomes um, a standard for contracts across the state of California and the United States, I think could be always related to that. Thank you, Thanmori. Um, Prem or Manmeet, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? So, uh, sorry, Manmeet. Uh, so there is like some technical issues and I think he's going to it again. So uh, I like to echo than, what Thanmori said. Uh, so this movement is uh, has become successful, not only by the leadership of Dalit students. So with the leadership, with the, with the support of like Manmit, you know, like Manmit and like other student leaders who are dominant themselves and supporting this movement. We can take example of Professor Rubani. We can take example of Professor Holly. We can take example of Professor Dr. Woods. There are so many professors at the department who were supportive, you know, without their support, I could not, we, I could not succeed that conference. That conference was re really very supportive to create awareness within social work department. So if that happens in other CSU campuses, definitely we can create, you know, that Dalit friendly environment within within our CSU system. And we need to, so it has started. And we need to continue that legacy. We need to continue the legacy of Dr. Ambedkar. So we have Manmit now. Oh no, I think T and Frame, sorry for the technical difficulties, but Frame and T covered it beautifully. Um, I'll just leave it at their remarks. Great, thank you. Um, still in this context, do you have best practices for CFA faculty and leaders on how to best support their cast of press students and colleagues in their environments? Yes, I definitely do. Um, I think that like when you kick start off, um, uh, you know, semesters or quarters um, and you are doing the kind of general announcement around protected classes and how people can report instances of discrimination, just make sure you enlist cast that makes a huge difference. If you have an area in your classroom or on your background where you have like a bunch of different social justice movements, you know, consider putting a little image of Dr. Embedkar, maybe a poster from Equality Labs. That's also, you know, these cultural signifiers kind of matter. Um, I also think that, you know, if you are someone who teaches in this field around justice and equity or Asian studies or racial equity, consider, um, you know, sharing or adding um, Dalit authors to um, your syllabi so that there's greater visibility in terms of what the Asian American experience is. 
Um, and then I also think that if you're doing catering or you're having events, I mean, I know we're not meeting in person and it's a long time away, but you know, what Prem mentioned is very interesting, which is the, the food prohibitions that kind of go along with that. So think about inclusive catering so that there's vegetarian and meat options. Don't solely lie on um, vegetarians on these uh, vegetarianism, because that's actually one of the, the food, um, uh, um, apartheid lines you see um so those are some things just like right off the top of the bat and and i also think like just making sure all of the training competencies for the union members is like up to date so even offering a cast training once a year and also you know pushing the university to bring them um, um, bring together all of their diversity and equity centers for a, a closed door cast equity training so that not only are all their dei reps trained but they also know that the union is there to enforce um, accountability on that because that's that's really one of the challenges is that when people you know and i'm saying this because i just talked to a university in the midwest where you have similar processes to what prem and manmeet have led their problem is is that their dei person is saying that um, caste doesn't exist they're demanding that they meet Dalit students who are terrified to come forward. And they're saying that it's Hindu phobic to add caste. So if the DEI person is the person that's blocking those conversations, that's, and it's a public university, it's, it's a real challenge, right? So I think that's why using the union um, CBA agreement to kind of force that accountability and implementation, I think could be really powerful. Thank you, Tanmore. I want to add, like, yeah, I want to add, uh, my, I, but just my, my idea is not different than uh, Tanmari. Like, uh, I want to highlight, highlight that we need to have caste equity action plan. So without that, adding caste or having policy doesn't work. So everywhere I have been telling that, like, in, like, South Asia, there is law but no implementation. So effective implementation is the most needed, much needed at this time. We need to create caste oppressed student friendly environment everywhere. And one more thing, like I, I, I do remember, like I, at my, at my capstone project, I wanted to do, uh, you know, like research within like Nepali diaspora, like Nepali within like among Nepali Dalits, right? So at that time, I, I was looking for the research fund at my department. I could not get that. There was no research fund and I could not afford that, you know, because my background, I'm from very poor background. So at that time, I talked to my professor Rubani and professor Rubani. So uh, like she, she, told, she told me like talk to Tanmori, she might have like some, some resources. So after I, when I talked with Tanmori, she connected me with one organizations and I got $5,000 as a grant, research grant. And that was very supportive me. And I'm looking other Dalit students like, like Professor Rubani and like Tanmari, like, you know, we need to have other faculties, supportive faculties. Every faculties must understand because Dalit caste oppressed students, they are from the poor background. They need like support in each and every part, right? For me, like English is not my first language. So you can understand, right? So language is my barrier, but my professors, they, they very supported me, like they always encouraged me. No, Prem, yes, you are doing good. You are doing, so that motivated me. Finally, I, gra I graduated from my MSW program. So that kinds of encouragement, that kinds of motivation is mandatory because there is high school dropout rate at, at my community at our community. So all the faculties can make a huge difference. So time has come to act. So action speaks louder than words. I, I think I should not say that. And 
So this equity conference is another example. Thank you. And Lisa, if I could just add to what Prem said, um, I think what Prem is pointing to is that Castor Press students don't have access to the same alumni networks and professional lifts that other dominant cast people have and you know frankly like other people who aren't um, working class in the same way and you know given the diversity of the cal state body i mean all of you are faculty be exactly because of who the students are and you know cal state you know students are some of the most diverse in the country and and I, I do think I go back to like that metric, you know, of diversity and equity. Is it about access or is it about success? And a student's life cycle isn't just in the classroom. It's all about the power of their alumni networks. And I, I have found that, you know, being a minority within a minority is that Dalit students flail upon graduation you know, because they don't lack that that piece. And so I think particularly if you are a faculty member in a STEM program, or if you are in, you know, a professional pipeline, like the way that Prem's program is in social work, I thought one thing that I saw that was really important about Prem's development is that all of the faculty in that department were really working with Prem to say, hey, do you know about this professional association? Maybe you would consider doing, you know, a um, an internship there, or hey, I can also connect you to this thing. So, you know, especially for like newly immigrant um, students, the way that a America's, you know, power systems work are really confusing. And, you know, I'll give you an example from my own process. Um, you know, I went to UC Berkeley and I don't think I went to the Alumni Center until a week before I was going to graduate. I didn't, you know, I didn't, I didn't know that you could, I didn't know that you should do that. You know, I didn't, I really didn't know anything because I was the first person in my family to go to higher education. And I really loved being in school, but I also worked full time while I was an undergrad. And I was just struggling to just make sure I got all the education I could get in because I just wanted to bathe in school, you know, but I, I didn't know that other people, especially Americans, that they know, actually, make sure you have your internships, make sure that you go to the Alumni Center, get your job lined up, make sure that you have that. And, you know, I did my master's at USC, and it was such a different you know, environment in a private school, especially one that's so aggressive, you know, their whole thing is all about their alumni power. So they force you to go to the alumni center early. They're making you get into internships. They're very aggressive about the success of their students afterwards. And, you know, I, of course, I know resources are stretched all across the system. So I'm not asking you guys to take on work that should be done by the university, but, but to just know that, you know, mentorship matters, you know, um, you know, being able to be able to know that there is this extra challenge, you know, um, for all immigrant students really to better understand how power networks work. And, um, and if you are in a particular discipline, even taking some time to sketch out the path to power, you know, this is how you go from being a student in my class to being a leader in the field and bringing in speakers that can kind of walk around those steps. Like, the, again, as someone who is a Dalit immigrant who, you know, was the first of my family to be educated in the United States, so much was so confusing, you know, and, you know, even the fact that people do campus visits, I know that that sounds hilarious, but I didn't know that you should do campus visits. I literally just wrote to five schools and um, and I went to Berkeley because I wanted to be in Berkeley. I didn't know. I like I got into these are the schools I got into. I got into Harvard. I got into Stanford. I got into Berkeley and then um, I got into UCLA and I was like, well, I want to be on the steps, you know, where people fought for free speech. And I went to Berkeley. <laughs> that's, how, that's how I made my decision. You know? um, and I don't regret it one bit. Um, but again, I as I've helped other students come through the program, I realized there's so much preparation actually that Americans do, like they're going on these campus tours. And again, you know, programs like Bridges, which is my experience that I went in Berkeley, all those preparatory programs to help diverse students to um, succeed, if we can make sure that there are allotments or ways that we can help Dalit students on board into that, that could be really wonderful. Thank you so much. We have several questions from our members. 
Um, the first one is from Sharon Elise and I think Talitha Martin um, for the panelists. I'm interested in what you believe led to this civil rights movement for caste protection emerging at this historical moment. Uh, you know, I think there's a lot of things contributing to it. You know, um, I think one first plank was that in 2018, we released a report that documented caste um, discrimination in the United States. You saw some of those figures. And that was like a first kind of, you know, opening where Dulles started to come out of the closet around the country. And then once the Cisco case occurred, the floodgates went, you know, because it was finally a government institution is really understanding that things are just completely not right. And I think that's really what's led to the power of it, because I think like Cisco happened in June and Professor Ruvani like connected me to like Prem about maybe a month or two later. Um, so it, you know, Prem is part of a wave of Dalit leaders who are really taking um, power at this moment. And so, and, and we're very lucky to live in California because the conditions were right for it. You know, like the California Democratic Party added CAS. We have many, many leaders who are part of uh, this conversation. Um, and I think while I'm here, I'll, I'll answer one of the other questions, Lisa, the one about the disaggregation of the Asian demographic category. Um, I think that, you know, I would be interested to hearing like from, you know, other um, Asian American faculty from the caucus. Um, you know, what's interesting is, is that, you know, caste is in South Asia, but it's also amongst other communities um, and tribal relationships in like, immigrants from Africa, immigrants from uh, Japan, immigrants from Latin America, for example. So you would actually probably have a wider data set if you were to do cast across all of these nations. Um, but, you know, I think for South Asian, uh, but for the Asian category, um, you know, I think that if you were going to disaggregate on the basis of caste, you'd also have to do it um, where it's kind of like it would be Asian, but then it wouldn't be South Asian. You would have to do Asian and then go Indian American, Nepali. You'd go down nationalities because you'd want to see caste in relationship to all of those pieces. So I almost feel like what we need is a national South Asian demographic um, survey. And then within that, disaggregate by caste and religion, and then we get the full figure. But that number has been very hard to get because um, most of the big data servers, like you know, services like YouGov and all of that, the people who are their go-tos for South Asians are almost always dominant caste. So the data will skew um because we're, our communities aren't plugged into it that's why we did the snowball sample because dalits do trust us as an institution and we our base is very active but they're not in any of those other uh social social sociological processes so i do think that it's it's a hard process to kind of solve for and um but you know i i think that for example though like you know i certainly think that within the california faculty association and through the apita caucus it might be interesting to even get get some test data through the caucus itself to say you know of the faculty here how many identify as cast depressed and see if anyone feels comfortable to come forward i wouldn't use a lack of numbers to you know as the sign of people not coming forward i think people are deeply afraid you know that makes a lot of sense. I know that this particular caucus has been talking about trying to gather better data on um, disaggregated data on who are we as Asians. And that's a great, um, now's probably one of the best times for us to start that because we have another reason um, to do that and to realize um, why we may not be getting very much response in some of those areas. I think this current data book is gonna show there were like seven people who identified as Pacific Islanders or something like that. So um, we know that there are just a lot out there. So thank you so much for that. Um, I'm gonna to try to combine um, the two questions from Aparna Sinha and Nena Torres about names. And is there a way, um, and apologies for ignorance, um, is there a way that names are giving away someone's caste or what, and what can we say to our Dalit um, brothers and sisters who are forced to change their names? Uh, what can we say to empower them? 
Um, I can I can answer this and then Mamit and Prem if you want to jump in. So what's very interesting is like some of those questions what you guys are pointing to are what we call cast social locators. There are certain kind of insider questions that, you know, to an outsider look completely normal, but are actually in terms of the community's inside dynamics are very much meant to kind of identify um, someone's cast background. And I'll give you an example of like a very innocuous cast social locator. Um, and that's uh, something called like the Tam Bram Pat. It's called, and that's short for Thummel Brahmin Pat. And we've heard many uh, male tech workers speak about this, but when they first join a tech unit, um, another colleague who's a man will um, pat his back, you know, very kind of innocuously, like, hey, brother, and just put his hand there because he's checking to see if they have the sacred thread that Brahmins wear um, on their back. And if they have that, they know he's a part of the inside of the club. And if he doesn't have it, they know, oh, okay, this is someone who's other. Um, similarly, like people will ask people's last names or where they're from in terms of India to also get a sense because caste works like a geographic apartheid. You know, just because you're from a town, there is a good side of a town and then there's the bad side of the town. So if they know, oh, you live there, that means you're from the Dalit slums. And so then they know right away, this person is not the good person, you know? So last names are also codes for that. And, you know, many of the last names that we are, we kind of associate with, um, you know, Indians and South Asians are actually upper caste last names. So Patels, um, Rajputs, um, Ayer, Iyengar, these are names that have a very strong history with caste dominant people. And m many of the people that have that last name are very proud to use it and they'll often kind of valorize it in their conversations with other people. Um, uh, and for many Dalit people, they hide their names, you know, and it's not it's not uniform like, you know, but Prem, for example, has a last name that's very much linked with Dalit identity. So everyone who sees who has a buddy out last name, they're like, oh, he's a Dalit. So his his identity is known right from the bat because Prem did not change his name. And I, and I would say it's kind of like. You know, I think sexual sexual orientation is a really good example of this. You know, you don't ever want to put someone on spot. Like, so this isn't a situation where you'd be like, oh, what's your cast? Because that could, it's a very kind of precarious question because so many people are, um, you know, afraid of being outed. But I think what it is, it's about gentleness. You know, when you're kind of trying to, um, you know, uh, it's about kind of leaving the food and then letting to see who comes to eat, you know, so what I would do is like just kind of say, you know, this is a cast equitable workplace, just like we're equitable with everything else. And, you know, I just do love to hear the stories of cast oppressed leaders. And, you know, that's why for Dalit History Month, we're going to celebrate, you know, Dr. Ambedkar. And when you leave a lot of breadcrumbs like that, and people know that you're a safe and empathetic person that, you know, that cares about issues of justice, then what will start to happen is that people will stay, they'll linger after class. And then there might be the whisper. So it's like, you know, Professor, um, you know, I just wanted to ask you something. And then slowly the trust will get built. Like our students don't necessarily always come out in classes, but they'll always be the, the first one there and the last one to leave because of the hunger to be educated, the hunger to be seen, and the hunger to be in a mentorship relationship. Because as Prem mentioned, back in our countries of origin, we are treated, you know, terribly. We are segregated even in educational environments and people could care less if we live or die. And so it's a very new thing to be around faculty that care for us and an educational environment that that who who is concerned about our success. I mean, it's such a it's such an incredible act of rehumanization, you know, and I think it's a reminder about why each and one each of you here are faculty, you know, this isn't like a regular job. This is about changing human lives and the destiny of families that and the, the people you touch is more than just that student. It's all of the families who are freed of this lineage of violence. So being able to leave those breadcrumbs of trust and then just stepping away with a light touch you'll be surprised who starts to come out. You know? 
So let me add something. Uh, yeah, Tanwari said a lot about that. So let me give some uh, real example from my life. So my wife uh, and uh, her parents, they changed, they, I mean, they, they changed their surname. Uh, I mean, they used the surname of dominant caste to survive as to survive as human. And what happened after marrying, uh, after, uh, after the marriage, so uh, her friends started to criticize, oh, so she, she got married with, uh, with an untouchable person. <laughs> they, they started to criticize that. And they tried to dig deeper and deeper. And at the end, they knew that. So she is also from like from Dalit caste. And what happened? They started to talk with my wife. That's the reality. And I could also hide my surname. I could use the surname of dominant caste. But I thought that is not the solution. I chose to fight. Fighting is the solution because I need to fight for my coming generation. So one more example I want to give you from the Bay Area. So one of my friend, so he has very good knowledge and, but what happened? He used the dominant caste surname from his father. His father also has the dominant caste surname. He has also that surname. And we were together in one like community event. And one of the dominant caste community leader, he came to me and you know what he said? Prem, do you know this guy? This guy is also from your community. Though he has dominant caste surname, he belongs to your caste. I was very surprised. Oh my God, in the Bay Area, educated people, community leader, community organizer, has that poor money mindset. So I thought like, you know, this fight is necessary. This fight is the most, you know, much needed. Though people are educated, but in the name of preserving culture, they are preserving superstitions. So our fight is for that. Our fight is for our coming generation. And our fight is for social justice. We want the so we want just in the society. And hiding identity, hiding caste identity is not the solution. Again, I just want to say thank you so much. Um, Many of us don't have to think about our privilege in this world to share our name or to share our story, to share our faces, to share our identities. And we just can't thank you enough for bringing forward these issues to increase our knowledge about how discrimination still, still happens in a very prominent way that many of us don't think about anymore because we don't see it as blatantly here uh, it still exists and it's still pretty blatant, but it's not as, I think, forward as, as we tend to think. And so I want to thank you all for your time and your education and your um, understanding and generosity today. I also want to thank the APETA Caucus and the Council for Social and Racial Justice for allowing us to have this space. And we will definitely be in or begin to incorporate some of the suggestions that you've given us. I believe April is also Asian American Heritage Month. And so we will definitely put one of those uh, activities that we do to talk about um, 
Dalit issues and and things like that. Yes, oh, Lisa, I just have one thing. So luckily, Asian American History Month is in May. So oh, is it May? Sorry, you, April. You can have two months of excitement. You know, don't worry. Um, well, we will push for that anyway. I don't think yeah. I, I, Adrita will have a problem with that. <laughs> um, no, but I was going to say there was one other thing which we discussed before this panel that I also wanted to lift up is that basically everybody wants to look at CFA's documents. They want to look at the resolution. They want to look at how the CBA um, was written. Um, and also, I think, you know, anything's, you know, I think one thing that we might be able to collaborate on is even putting together a list of testimonies of Dalit students and faculty um, that's accessible because every time there's a back campus, they're, they're needing to build evidence chains all over again. And so if we could work with um, CFA to even put up a single page with that stuff, that would be very powerful. We can definitely work on that. Um, so thank you everybody for being here today and being a part of this discussion. Um, know that you will have our continued support. Uh, thank you Vang and Andrew for all your hard work in getting this organized and uh, have a great rest of your equity conference. Thanks so much everyone.